this is the first ever met webinar, I believe, or at least the first ever met webinar since I've been affiliated with the MET program. So I'll just make that claim. I'm Leah McFadden. Um, I have been an instructor in the MET program for several years, but I now uh, hold a position as really the first um, focused, dedicated faculty member in the MET program. So part of our new push to uh, revitalize and move the program forward. So um, it's exciting. There's lots going on. We have a new website launched today. And uh, I'm very pleased, delighted, in fact, to be able to host our speaker today, Dr. Tony Bates. Um, Tony has asked me to please not spend too much time introducing him. Um, but I think it's important to um, emphasize just how much experience Dr. Bates has without, you know, giving away his age. Um, Tony has been working in the world of distance and online learning for many decades. He had an uh, established career as a professor in uh, the United Kingdom until the 1990s when he uh, like me, fled from the UK to Canada, um, first to work with, the, I think, the Open Learning Agency. Is that right, Tony? Yep. <laughs> and, then, and then I usually tell people that Tony uh, was stolen by UBC, and he came to UBC um, in the, tell me, late 90s, Tony? 95. 95. To, uh, and I, I often credit him with dragging UBC into the online era when it comes to the world of distance learning. Um, and importantly, Tony was a key player in launching the Master of Educational Technology program in the late 90s and leading into the early 2000s. So he really has a very long history with us at UBC, um, but before and subsequently as a uh, consultant and visiting professor with a number of other uh, institutions. He consults all over the world on online and distance learning and in the last few years has been collaborating on a large project to try to learn more about online and distance learning in Canadian universities and colleges. Tony approached me and asked if he could um, somehow talk to MET students about the work he's been doing, and I'm very pleased to host him today to uh, share that with you. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Tony Bates, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, first of all, for the, for the live students, I really appreciate your finding time on a, uh, a long weekend with a holiday, a very important holiday weekend in Canada. So I really do appreciate that. Uh, and secondly, I'm really pleased to be talking to MET students because, as Leah said, I was very much involved in establishing this program when I was at UBC. And uh, I'm so glad that so many of you are, are, are taking this program. What I'm looking for here really is to see if the, amongst you, um, both those who are live and those who are going to watch the recording, whether anybody would be interested in maybe doing something on this project, if you have to do uh, a project for the MET program and so on. Uh, I'll make it clearer uh, how easy this will be for you as I go through the presentation. But let me first of all start off by uh, talking about the survey that we've done and why we did it, what results we've got, so, and particularly some of the research issues that, that we came across. So I'll get, start with a short background to the survey. Um, in fact, uh, last year was the first time we did it, and we've re we're repeating the survey this year. Uh, we've just got the results in from 2018, and we're still analyzing them at the moment. Um, but I want to focus particularly on the main research issues and then look at possible uh, research for MET student, one student or more students who might be interested in doing this as a project, doing something as a project with the data that we've collected. 
Let me give you the background to the survey. And in fact, I should point out there is a similar survey being done by a totally different group for the K-12 sector. It's by an organization called Can eLearn, C-A-N eLearn. Um, so if you're interested in the K-12 data, then this is a different survey. It's completely independent from this one. But I'm only focusing on post-secondary education in Canada here. In uh, the United States, the Babson Survey Research Group for 15 years was doing collecting data on online stu uh, students and distance education students in the USA. And more recently, the, Depart the Federal Department of Education in the USA uh, collects data now in, in its annual IPED survey. So there's a lot of data in the US about online students. And we've known from that data that online students enrollments have been increasing uh, quite rapidly over the last 15 years. And this has had quite a bit of impact on policy, both within institutions and particularly within state governments uh, across the United States. And I'd been complaining for a number of years that there was no comparable Canadian data for the whole system. There'd been one or two surveys of part of the system, for instance, Ontario and Quebec in different years uh, uh, collected data on their online students, but nothing for the country as a whole. And uh, uh, I was approached by the Babson Survey Research in 2016 and put together a volunteer team and worked with Babson and WCET in the US. Um, we basically used their survey methodology, uh, so we didn't have to create that from scratch. Um, but the rest we had to put together ourselves. We obtained funding from provincial e-campuses in Canada, particularly e-campus Ontario, and plus a little bit of funding from uh, Pearson Publishing and D2L, the uh, uh, learning management system uh, uh, company. So why do we want to do the survey? Well, because it's becoming increasingly important and it's rapidly changing. In we had, but we had no data in Canada who is actually offering online courses, how many students are taking online courses, uh, what the main challenges institutions are, f are facing, uh, nor what their institutional strategies were if they had any for online learning. And we know that in the USA it was used for policy decisions by governments and institutions. So the first thing we had to do is to get a roster of institutions uh, and some interesting questions came up here. What is a university or college in Canada? Who decides whether it's a university or college? There is, in fact, no official national lists of uh, colleges in, and universities. Uh, Statistics Canada collects data on uh, students, so they must have a list, but they don't publish the list. They just publish the, the, uh, the results they get. And we did contact Statistics Canada, but to be honest, they weren't particularly helpful. They were too busy doing other stuff, basically. Now, there is an organization called Universities Canada with a list of members, but a lot of those members are what I would call old universities that have been amalgamated with the main university. So these are often now residential colleges on the campus of a big university like University of Toronto. It's got about a dozen old universities, mainly religious background, so there's a uh, UBC's got something on campus very similar. It's got an Anglican college, it's got a Catholic college, and so on. So do we count those separately or do we roll them in with the other universities? There's also an organization called Colleges and Institute Canada, which also has a list of members, but they include private colleges as well as public ones. Um, so we had to set us we had to set some criteria for making sure that we had a consistent set of institutions in the roster of all institutions in Canada. So the first criteria, it had to be recognized by the provincial or federal government, I should have added. There are a couple of colleges and universities run by the federal government. So it had to be recognized by a provincial government. We could, you can find that from most provincial governments on their advanced education websites. It had to receive some public funding. We were focused primarily on the public sector um, because certainly for universities, there aren't many private 
universities in Canada, unlike the United States, and they had to award their own degrees to diplomas. That's how we got around the problem of the old universities that were amalgamated, because basically it's the main university that offers the degrees for those students. So that were the criteria we used. And this is what we ended up with. We ended up in 2017 with 72 universities, 81 colleges outside Quebec. We had to make a separate category for the colleges in Quebec called CGEPs, partly because they, they include grade 12 right through to first year university students, unlike the uh, uh, career and vocational colleges outside Quebec, which are primarily post-secondary institutions. Uh, and then we were asked by our, by our partners in Quebec for 2018 to add a group of colleges that are private, but where students get grants from the government to attend. So it's a little bit complicated there, but they are publicly funded, so they met our criteria. So we had 203 institutions on the roster. That's all the, all, all the institutions that we think are in Canada in, in, in the target group that we're trying to reach. Um, it went up to 82 in 2018. There were some constituents of the University of Montreal, um, which are really semi-autonomous and wanted their own questionnaires because they run more or less independently and award their own degrees in Quebec. We didn't know that at the time. And the other thing is there's about six or seven universities in Canada that are Anglophone, but have a Francophone college. So we had to send a separate questionnaire in French for those, and uh, they had a separate bu bunch of students from the others. So we counted them as a separate institution, although they're part of a, a regular university. So that's why it went up to 82. And we had one college that became a university, actually, between 2017 and 2018. So that's why the college numbers went down. So we ended up this year with 234. So that, that's who we were trying to get. Now, how many responded? Well, first of all, we sent an online question, actually sent an invitation with a URL for an online question. But another question we had to decide was, well, who do we send this invitation to? So we sent it to the VP academic or the provost or the VP education in the colleges. But we knew that in many cases, it would just sit on the provost desk because that's what happens. And so we also sent copies usually to the director of the, for the Center for Teaching and Learning in each institution and the head of institutional research, or if there wasn't one, to the registrar. Um, so what we had to do basically was build a database of institutions. And here's what we put in the database. Uh, well, we gave each institution a code number. That's important because we said we wouldn't identify individual institutions. Um, um, the type of institution, whether it's a university or a college or a CGEP, the number of student enrollments, uh, this is sort of public figures, how many students they publicly claim to have, uh, what language they used, English or French, uh, who the contact people were, and what province they were in. So first of all, this is what the spreadsheet looks like. This is the initial database with uh, different columns, whether they reply to the questionnaire, how many students they've got, etc. And then we organize that a bit by province. So uh, you probably can't see that very clearly, but it's the code number down the left, uh, whether they should be included or not, because we looked at every, everything before we uh, got to the final 200 or so on the roster, uh, whether they sent whether they responded in 2017 or in 2018, and uh, that column here is how many, uh, how many, how many students are taking at least one online course uh, from that in, in that institution, and so on. So, you know, we, we end up with a spreadsheet with maybe 40 or 50 columns going to the right, and then we run tables from that to get the uh, actual data. And this is what the tables look like. We get percentages and numbers uh, for each of the questions that we've asked. And this is a sample question. It's on blended hybrid courses. Uh, first of all, we usually give a definition. These are courses designed 
to combine both online and face-to-face -face teaching in any combination. We've had tremendous problems with definitions, getting definitions that everybody agrees on. Um, and then we asked, do you have any? Yes, no. And then uh, what best describes the current situation have, start, have not started and likely that we will. And then at the bottom, very importantly for most questions, we have an open-ended question where uh, institutions could give us more information about what they're doing. And that's proved very important for understanding a lot of the answers we've got. So what happened in 2017, we got a nearly a 70% response rate from institutions. And because the bigger institutions were more like likely to respond and the smaller ones weren't, it covered about 78% of the population, of student population. So one interesting question in research is, uh, when is the response rate high enough? Um, and you, many surveys go for large numbers and get very low response rates. And there's a big problem then because it's very hard to generalize from say 30% of the population when you've got twice as many people not responding as you've got responding. You have to be really careful that you've got a very representative sample. If you can get up to about 70%, you don't have to worry too much about that. You've caught most of the institutions. So you can start making fairly confident generalizations. And you can look at the ones that didn't respond and see what the characteristics of them. We know that it's mainly small institutions, for instance. What we found is that nearly every post-secondary institution in Canada offers distance education courses for credit. Now, we focused on credit courses and not continuing education, non-credit courses in the first survey. The second thing is that online learning is a mature market in Canada. Um, many institutions have been offering online learning now for 15 years or more. And so the num new number of new institutions offering courses is quite small each year because there aren't many left. We, we got nearly 90% of the institutions offering online courses. So almost all universities and colleges outside Quebec now, in Quebec, only 43% of the CGEPs offer online courses, and that's because there's a central institution called CGEP à distance that offers courses on behalf of all the other colleges. Although what was interesting is that some of the CGEPs now are starting their own online programs. They, want, they see this as critical to their future, and they don't want to have to go through another institution. So the main results, um, as I said, it's a mature market, so there's a small number uh, adding online to their, um, to their offerings, and these are mainly the small colleges. We found that the online enrollments in Canada were uh, growing rapidly, of about 10% per annum in universities and 15% per annum in the colleges outside Quebec. And we get, we will see that some of the uh, enrollment data we got isn't very reliable, but triangulating our research, which is always a good thing to do, we looked at our results, looked at the results from other studies of parts of the system. Um, we estimate that about 16% of all student online courses, about 16% of all courses are online, fully online courses in universities now, which is much higher than we anticipated, and about 12% in colleges. And the colleges are catching up fast, as you can see. Their rate of uh, increase is higher than the universities, but they started from a lower base. Tony, can I we ask a quick question? Online. Sorry, somebody. Can I? It's Leah. Yeah. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, I'm just wondering um, because you mentioned at the beginning that no one has done a complete survey before. Um, how how can you be reporting growth? Is this just growth as reported by individual oh. institutions? Yeah, we asked each institution what their enrollments were ah. from 2011 through to 2015. I see. So we based it on the ones who were able to provide that information. I see, thank you. And again, you will, you will see it wasn't all institutions that were able to do that, but that's based on the ones that were able to do it. Yes, please don't hesitate to put your hand up and ask anybody if you have questions. Um, 
we, we found that online courses were offered in almost every subject area, but may, the, 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 major, the major areas were business, education, and health. Um, but you could find uh, people say, oh, well, you can't teach engineering online. Well, there are some places where at least some courses in engineering are being offered online, and similarly in medicine and law and so on. So some people are finding a way to do it. <laughs> um, we also asked the, the institutions how important was online learning for you in terms of your future. And over two thirds rated online learning as either very important or extremely important for their future, which did surprise us again. It's quite a high percentage. And more, even more surprisingly, most have or are developing a strategy or plan for online learning. And here the open com uh, the open ended comments were really interesting because they said, well, yeah, we are developing a plan, or yes, we have a plan, but it's not really being implemented, and so on. And <laughs> so there was a lot of uh, hesitation about whether they whether the plan was working or not. Um, and we also asked about the technologies, and not surprising, learning management systems were used in nearly all institutions, but uh, print conferencing and video streaming and video conferencing like this are increasingly important. And in fact, I would say that w although we haven't looked at it over time yet, I, I suspect that in a few years we'll find that uh, synchronous delivery of online learning will overtake asynchronous delivery. That's what we, one of the things we're looking for in the research. We also looked at other technologies or um, services like open education resources used in 40%, open textbooks only in 18%. Although it's much higher in BC, of course, because there's an open textbook project in BC. Um, little or no use of analytics or artificial intelligence or adaptive learning, but we didn't ask specifically about that in 2017. We have asked about that in 2018, and we do have some institutions using each one of those um, technologies and, and, and other technologies such as uh, virtual reality. But these are difficult to track because it's really up to the individual instructor um, whether they use different kinds of technologies. And many institutions don't track this. They're just aware that somebody's doing it. So it's, it's not clear how widely these are being used within the institutions. And we had a definition of hybrid learning, some reduction in face-to-face -face teaching with the rest of the time taken up with online. And again, this was very broad, but very uh, shallow. In other words, many institutions had somebody in their institution teaching in this way, but very few people doing it. 60% uh, with less than 10% of courses that were hybrid. But they did say it was leading to some innovative teaching and better use of limited space in some places. So they, they're using it to tackle some timetabling problems in some places. But again, this is difficult to track. Um, again, this will be better done through a survey of instructors and a survey of institutions. We did ask about MOOCs. Um, there was no MOOC mania in Canada. Um, less than 20% of the institutions were offering MOOCs. And those that were doing it were using it in a very specific, using them in very specific ways. There were some uh, very successful MOOCs in Canada but they were looking at adding value in particular areas where the university felt it was very strong or where there was a great need locally for the MOOC. Um, I'll give you an example of that. One, one on Myanmar Aboriginal culture uh, offered by the Cape Breton University uh, in the Maritimes uh, as part of the truth and reconciliation to get people to better understand Aboriginal culture, for instance. Um, and the one that's illustrated here is on children's play, the importance of children's play in learning, um, which was done by a Francophone university, at, uh, University of Quebec at Trial Riviere. So it's a minority language, but a MOOC, and it had 5,000 uh, people sign on to it. So they were very pleased with that. They thought for them, 5,000 was more successful than 100,000 because it was a very specific purpose. But a lot of institutions said they have no interest in doing them in the future. 
Most of the benefits that were reported were increased access and flexibility, not surprisingly. But what did surprise us, a lot of the institutions, particularly in the Maritimes, very strongly in the Maritimes, are using online learning to maintain or increase their enrollments. Uh, many of the provinces in, the, in Maritimes, their populations are declining, their student numbers on campus are going down. So they are recruiting students from other, uh, other provinces. And one of the things that happens is that when those students go home in the summer, they want to carry on studying. Um, but so the, the Maritimes are beginning, institutions are beginning to offer online courses in the summer for their own students when they go home, which I thought was quite interesting. And also quite a few, over two thirds mentioned innovative teaching as a result of going online. The main barriers were lack of resources, especially learning technology staff. Um, instructional designers, web designers, and so on. 61% uh, said a, a resistance from faculty um, linked to a lack of training in providing uh, support for online learners, uh, for online teachers who want to go online. And very interesting response about the, the government support. About a third of the institutions c complained about lack of government support for uh, online learning. And that lack of government support had the highest number of responders, 62%. In other words, in Quebec, they felt they get less support from government, whereas the lowest is in Ontario, which has put a lot of money into eCampus Ontario and a lot of money into uh, creating online programs. So we got very clear evidence of the impact of government policies um, on online learning. And finally, we looked at a comparison between our data and that from the United States. And what we found was that there were more similarities and differences, surprise, surprise. Um, both in US and in Canada, there were problems with definition and data collection. Uh, there aren't clear agreement amongst institutions about what constitutes students, what constitutes online learning and so on. Uh, similar about institutional commitment and growth rates are about the same in Canada and the US. Again, in both, both countries, it's the larger institutions who tend to be more involved in online learning. And similar results about the strategic importance of online learning. But the systems are very different. We don't have many private not-for-profit universities. We don't have any of those, I don't think. We have a couple of religious universities like Trinity Western. Um, that, are, that are private, but we very small, whereas in the States, there have many different kinds of universities and colleges. However, the big problem in both, both countries is that institutions had a great difficulty in providing online course enrollment numbers. Many of the institutions told us they'd never bothered to track them until we asked for the figures. Um, and in fact, what's really heartening is this year, how many institutions said they didn't have the figures last year were able to provide them this year. So I, I think uh, one positive outcome of this survey is it's made institutions aware of the importance of collecting data in this area. Many reported their concern about the reliability of the data they gave in 2017. There were big variations between the provinces on data collection. Uh, Ontario and Quebec tended to ask their institution to provide this information to the ministry. So they already had this in place, but other places, particularly Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, uh, the government hadn't asked for that information, so it was more difficult for them to respond to us. So one of the recommendations that came out of the 2017 report was a standard system for reporting on digital learning which we sent out to all the institutions in 2017. And the results from 2018 suggest that's been really worthwhile. We've had much better response uh, to the questions than we had in 2017. But one of the big issues was how do you count students? Now, we thought this would be a simple thing. You would just ask every institution or every province, how many students go to UBC every year? Um, what we found was there was no one source of information on this in Canada. Promises varied in their data collection methods and what they made public. Uh, so you can go to some provinces and go online, and if you dig around, you can find 
on their advanced education website the data, but in other provinces you can't. Uh, for instance, there was a difference to between the, how institutions counted. Some counted only full-time students in their reporting, some counted full-time plus part-time students, and some counted what were called full-time equivalents. In other words, they would add up all the full-time students and then will give a percentage to part-time students, an arbitrary percentage in many cases, say 30%. So if they had three uh, part-time students, that would be one FTE. Now, of course, some part-time students could be 90% part-time and others could be 10% part-time. Uh, um, some counted uh, only those domestic students that the provincial government funded. So they didn't count the international students because they were self-financing. Uh, so again, often the reporting on student numbers is for financial reasons rather than for accountability reasons. Um, some counted non-credit students in with credit students, which is really confusing. So some, some, student, some institutions seem to have incredible numbers, and then you found out that thousands of them were non-credit students taking one course. Um, and as I said, there's a, some don't count online, they just count face to face and others count both. And again, often we found that they, the provinces only collected this data once in every five years. So we would have data from different provinces for 2016, 2017, 2014 and so on. So we found that in 2017, online was not tracked in about half the institutions. Some just made a guess. Those that did provide figures, it figures in, indicated growth between 2011 and 2015. And as I said, we got 16% by triangulating. But in 2018, we got a much higher response rate. We got 78% of the institutions this year. Um, and that covers 80%, 80, well, really, we, we had a couple of late ones. We're now up to nearly 90% of all Canadian post-secondary students are covered by our survey. So we have better data on enrollments because we had clearer definitions and more institutions tracking online. And for the important thing for, 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 for MET students who want to do research, the data uh, from 2017 and from 2018, including all the open-ended comments, are lodged with the Ontario College Admissions Service. So you can go to the raw data if you want to go that deep and start doing analyses, and analyses that we didn't do because we just didn't have time to do them. Um, and particularly the open-ended comments, there's a whole rich source of data there if you're interested, uh, particularly about, say, things like hybrid and blended learning, for, because we asked them to give examples of how that was working. And we, we didn't have the time to go through and say, look, here are about half a dozen different types of hybrid and blended learning. So if somebody wanted to do that, th that data is there. So we got two years of data, including open-ended comments. Also, there's an opportunity to input to the 2019 survey. If you have a question that you think the in should be asked of institutions, like, I don't know, um, where do you want to go with, um, are you scared by artificial intelligence? Because I am, um, you, know, <laughs> do you, you know, do you think it's good or bad, you know, that it's coming into education? Well, we could probably find a slot in the survey for you. So possible research questions would be looking at the links between government policies and in online enrollments, um, uh, trends in technology use, um, qualitative follow-up, why people are offering online learning, how are they doing it in more detail, like case studies, um, but fitting it into the overall data framework. Also, it's a jump-off point for studying some of the implications of this data. For instance, how do you scale up faculty training? Um, we have a very bad system of training faculty in universities and colleges. Um, it's all voluntary, um, and it's all right when only 10, 15% of the, uh, the courses are online, but when we're getting up to maybe 50 or 60% of blended learning, how do we prepare our, our instructors for that? How do we scale that up? Um, how do we plan for digital learning? What are the best practices in designing digital learning? Now we've got 
for instance, one fundamental question that there's no research on, it's amazing nobody's looked at this research, is that when you can offer a course both online and face-to-face, -face, what's best done on face-to-face? -face? Uh, how do you define why the students should come to campus if you can offer a lot of the course online? What is the extra added value of coming on campus for having a blended course? We have no research on this. We have lots of research on how to do good online courses, lots of research on how to do good face-to-face -face teaching, but nothing on what's best done. And that will depend on the subject area. It will depend on what kind of students you've got and so on. Um, research for small institutions, they struggle with online learning because they're not got a critical mass really uh, to have the expertise that needed to support online learning. It's not just a question of supporting faculty, it's things like can they afford a learning to, uh, to license a learning management system? We'd like to look more at what their issues are. What should, could or should government be doing to support online learning other than just throwing money at the problem? And what are the organizational issues now? Um, I raise that question because a lot of institutions uh, continuing Studies does the online um, course development, even for credit courses. Um, but the, now more and more of the face-to-face -face, uh, faculties teaching face-to-face -face on campus for credit courses, they want those resources that Continuing Studies have got. So there are organizational issues there. How do you find enough people to do this? Can we find better ways of providing support for faculty? UBC now has a very interesting site, for instance, on how to make a good video, how long it should be, et cetera, um, which is just online. Faculty can look it up. They don't have to get a, an expert in to tell them how to do it. And it's all based on research as well. So they can look at the research if, they're not, if they don't believe the, the advice. So if you are interested, Contact your instructor first to help define your research interest. I think that's really important if you want to do a project, and I don't know if you have projects on the MET, or if you want to do something outside of the MET, contact me at tony.bates at ubc.ca. I don't think you need a lot of research experience to do this kind of research. You have people in the team who've got that research experience, and we could perhaps guide you to some of the, of, of the things to do. But there's a lot of data there that we haven't had the time to touch. And it'd be a shame not to have somebody go in and have a look at that if you're interested. So if you want to see the reports that we've done, here are the URLs. Uh, if you're francophone, there's one in French as well as one in English. And so uh, thank you. And I, I hope you've got some questions or comments. <laughs> thank you, Tony. <clears throat> that was great. Um, just to clarify both for you and for the listeners, I'm sure most of our participants know this, current MET students have the option of um, planning what's, what's commonly known as a 580. The course code is ETEC 580, which is a directed studies project. Um, you can actually um, earn up to 12 credits of, uh, through completing ETEC 580, so you can take multiples if you're working on an ongoing project. The, the uh, important factor about that is that ETEC 580 projects need to have a supervisor. So um, that's something that you would work out in consultation with us and Dr. David Vogt, who is the graduate advisor for the MET program, is the person that you really need to contact if you've got a burning idea. I think, Tony, you mentioned that there may be people in your group um, who would be willing to collaborate with MET students on a project or kind of co-supervise a project, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And the other thing I should have mentioned is that we have a little bit of money as well, not a lot, but we oh. could probably offer up to $5,000, you know, to support a student on the project. I see. Um, okay. It's not a lot of money, but it, it certainly helps. <laughs> All right. So if, if students, you, well, you've already given us your contact information, but people should contact you if they have burning ideas or questions that they would be um, yes, but I interested would be, in pursuing. If they're an MET registered student, I would much prefer they first went to their supervisor to make yeah. sure this fits with their program. Good. Yeah, great. 
And I, I'm quite sure that a number of people in the audience or watching afterwards are people who've completed the MET program and who, so who are experienced and credentialed and out there in the world and may also be interested in collaborating with you simply out of the burning thirst for new knowledge. Um, and I, I assume that those folks would be welcomed as well. Yes, of course. Yeah. Let me ask a question to kick us off. Uh, right. uh, one of my questions is, um, I'm curious whether you asked in either year about whole programs that are made available online or whole degrees rather than simple courses. Is that yes. something that you have asked and did you collect yes. data on that? Yes, we, we did ask that. Um, we had a question on, but you, there was a, we asked, there, there was a bar chart showing um, online courses, but we had a similar bar chart for online programs. Obviously, there are much fewer programs than courses, but, um, and uh, again, they tended to be in health, education, and business, and less so in engineering, law, and health, uh, and medicine. Um, I mean, health is mainly nursing, and nursing, nursing has a very strong um, online uh, presence in online learning. Um, I, hello, Dr. Bates. I'm Momita. I'm just curious. <clears throat> did you find anything about why certain uh, fields were more uh, prone towards online learning? Like why nursing in particular? Like is that, does that have anything to do with a lot of in, international students or the like other, like I, I know for sure that in Canada there are many many uh, nursing uh, they, they have the nurses register like they need to get a particular license to have nursing so is there those kind of programs or is there a correlation between what courses are online versus what courses are not that much online? Yeah, not surprisingly, we didn't have a lot of data on international students, but um, the data we had suggested that most institutions didn't have many international students online, uh, maybe a few graduate programs where they had that. And one of the reasons was, of course, they want the students on campus um, because they pay very high fees. Um, and the online courses tend to be cheaper for a start. Um, well, not cheaper than the on-campus ones, but certainly cheaper than the international students pay. So. Um, we need to ask more questions about that. Um, I, I think there's a big market there, but one of the problems, of course, is they have to meet the uh, mission requirements of the institutions before they can enroll internationally from, from, from if they're international students. So that's a barrier. But uh, I don't think the distance is the barrier. I think there are lots of other barriers that the institutions put up. Um, to, to the, well, they don't market often to international students. They they market really to their local students. In fact, I, I would say something like 75% of all students doing distance courses are local students uh, taking courses from their own institution. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I answered your question properly. Uh, no, thank you. Yeah. I've, I've found the chat. Um, oh, good. We didn't. First, I, um, uh, for Mamita, was this question, do we ask question to students how important are online courses for the future? No, this, this was an institutional questionnaire. I think there's a, one of the things we're interested in is uh, partnering with the National Student um, Outcome Survey uh, to see if we can put some questions in about online learning and students' response to online learning. So we didn't, well, there's definitely room for um, a student-based survey, but that, that's a, an order of magnitude more difficult for us to do, incidentally, than doing an institutional survey. Um, yeah, the question like came to my mind because it was said that the how important the online courses are for the future, and I wanted to understand whose perception are was covered in the survey. Yeah, um, no, we yeah. didn't ask whether the students thought they were important. Uh, yeah. That students are voting with their feet. I mean, the on online enrollments are growing much faster <coughs> than the campus-based enrollments. 
campus based enrollments are going up about two to three percent per annum in Canada, whereas the online enrollments are going up about ten to fifteen percent. So, like, just to follow up, so when you, when we talk about importance of the online courses, is it is it mainly focused on the importance of the institution's financial growth, or like like more where they see a need for education or the future of education like i i'm just curious to know what what was the angle of the question i don't think we i don't think we've got information on that okay. I, I i you know we would have to ask that specifically okay thank you um somebody asked what would you can I think it's Tariq, is it? Yeah, Tariq asked, what would you consider primary drivers for the growth of synchronous education compared to asynchronous? Uh, I hate to say this, but I think it's because it's easy for faculty to take their lecture-based methods and just put them online and at a distance. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the value of asynchronous education amongst faculty. They've never done it. Um, they tend to think that lecture they, that it just by putting their lectures online that that's going to solve the problem of delivering to online students. Um, and also some of them are demanding that students are actually physically present so they can have an online uh, synchronous discussion, for instance. And I think that's a real misunderstanding of the needs of students who take online courses who often find it very difficult to be at a specific place at a specific time uh, to do a synchronous um, uh, communication. So I think there's two things. One is the streaming of lectures. Um, and so th th that it's easy just to take lectures and, and put them online. And the second is an, a misunderstanding or a lack of knowledge of the value of asynchronous communication, particularly asynchronous discussion forums. Um, you know, there's a good argument for both synchronous and asynchronous discussions, but most faculty are just not aware or familiar with asynchronous discussion. Could I ask a follow-up question? This is Tarek. Yeah. Um, so, um, could this then, could the root cause for, for all this be the growth and the fast rates of growth uh, and that faculty who are not experienced and don't get the professional development are pu being pushed into this area? There's an enough time being spent on course development, and so asynchronous. Uh, sorry, synchronous seems like a better option because asynchronous has a lot of development time up front that has that, to go that's into. That's true. It. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, when I said it's it's easier for them, it meant it's less work for them. <laughs> of course, yeah, because asynchronous. Uh, oh well, it, apparently a lot more. less work. Of course, what they're doing is repeating the lectures every year. Whereas yeah. if they did an asynchronous course, they would get some economies of scale that way of not having to repeat it every year. But um, yeah, and you're right. In some cases, faculty are being forced to do online learning, even if they don't want to. Um, you know, the, the institution is pushing them in that direction. And they, especially the sessional instructors, they don't have any choice on this. So they have to do it if that's what the department requires. Or they or they don't get hired and paid, so there's that pressure on them as well. Um, and I, I, I mean, this is outside the survey. It's from my other work. I've been to many institutions where there's a very good and very willing um, support group, and faculty just refuse to make use of them, and think they, that they can just do it themselves without any training or advice. And that's really frustrating. <laughs> ah, yes, the faculty ego problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, do universities in general offer flexibility to the instructor on how to design courses? Well, we didn't ask that question. And again, it depends very much on the relationship between the Center for Teaching and Learning um, and, and the faculties. Uh, some faculties have their own uh, support staff here. Um, some in, most institutions have a small fund, so a faculty can, get, can apply for that fund to get uh, one semester 
free of their teaching, um, so they, they have a session was hired in their place, so they can spend time redesigning an online course. Um, but not all institutions do that, and, and I think that's a good question for us to ask in future, um, what kind of support they give to instructors to design online courses. I have a question about uh, uh, high school students and the effect that this has on their education. Um, what are the implications, if any, for their learning and, and uh, what should high schools uh, be doing? For example, should they be looking at uh, implementing online courses to help students prepare uh, for how to learn with these courses? Well, I think you need to look at the uh, K-12 to survey for an answer to that question. My understanding is that it, this varies a lot from province to province. British Columbia is probably ahead of the rest in terms of uh, the number of students taking online courses in high schools, and it has a support system for that through, I think it's called Open School, um, but in other provinces that's not necessarily the case. So how does it affect many of these courses, many of the students taking online courses in BC don't have a specialist teacher because they're in a small school or a smaller school, or they're taking it because uh, they're trying to pick up an extra couple of subjects, for instance, um, or their local instructor isn't very strong, and they're going outside to find another way of doing, to, doing the course, for various reasons why they, why they take the online courses. Um, but I think you would need to look at the K-12 report. Uh, if you go to my website and Tony, tonybates.ca and type in in the search engine uh, K-12 to online, you'll, you, you'll probably find uh, the report that way. Somebody asked how the roles of instructors are changing. I think they're changing very slowly. I think that's Mumita again. Um, I think that what does happen is that instructors do learn when they go on, if, particularly if they're going, start doing, um, uh, recording of video lectures, they start to learn fairly quickly that A, they have to be much shorter, and B, they have to build in some kind of interactivity into their, into their online lectures. So, um, and that then starts making them think about redesigning their courses. So uh, then they start thinking more about how they could use the learning management system in conjunction with. So, I mean, faculty do learn as they go, and they do get better as they go, and they do sometimes start asking for for help because they got problems when they go online without support. So yes, I think the the roles are, are changing, but. You have to remember that universities are 800 years old and online learning is only 20 years old. So it might take another 50 years before a lot of them have actually got around to learning how to teach well in this media. Well. Um, somebody asked how teaching in online environments could be innovative. Uh, what's happening in, in some cases that um, professors are using quite simple uh, technologies like mobile phones to make uh, recordings of um, data, or recordings of uh, situations, and uh, getting students to do analysis of those. Uh, there's a faculty member in UBC who took something like uh, a Quest program, you know, where you have to go out and find things and earn points for that. Uh, it was in uh, forest, forestry uh, and soil, soil, soil mechanics, and so they, they had sites around the UBC forest where the students could go and take samples and do uh, collect data and report on data and send that back by their mobile phones, for instance. So there's lots of examples of instructors finding fairly neat ways of uh, using digital learning, I would call it more than online learning. Um, to make their teaching more uh, interactive, make students more active in, the, in their learning. So I, I think that that's happening, um, and it's happening from the bottom up rather than people coming in and saying, this is the way you should use technology. And I, I find that very encouraging. The, the problem is that most institutions don't have a strategy for innovation in teaching. 
So that one individual teacher will do something really neat, but it doesn't get much beyond that individual teacher. It doesn't even get into other instructors in the department because there's no strategy for doing that. And I, I think institutions need to have a strategy for supporting innovation in teaching. Uh, somebody asked about, I, t I think it's Tariq, about MOOCs outside Canada. Ironically, MOOCs seem to be strongest in Europe these days. Uh, the, your, MOOCs are very popular in uh, Europe. Um, they're pretty strong in from some institutions in the United States, mainly the uh, elite universities like Harvard and MIT and Stanford. Um, and a few, the, a few of the, um, they tend to be the more prestigious universities in Canada, like University of Alberta and Toronto. They first went into MOOCs, and for instance, Toronto did MOOCs first, and then decided that maybe online learning was worth doing after all, and started doing it now for credit courses. Um, but they've been, it's very interesting MOOCs because online learning have been around for at least 15 years before MOOCs came along, and they be, online learning had been ignored by these prestigious universities. And MOOCs, I think, were a way of rebranding online learning um, yeah. in terms of the elite institutions and keeping it separate from their on-campus offerings. Um, so they, they, if you looked at the kind of propaganda that came out, you know, they, as if they'd invented online learning, and that's what MOOCs, MOOCs were online learning. And in fact, of course, other forms of online learning for credit have been going on for a long time in other institutions. So I, I think that kind of division is beginning to break down now, but it was very interesting, the kind of what you might call the, um, the, the, the philosophy and ideology behind MOOCs was very different from the use of credit-based online learning. Tony, um, I'm, I'm aware that it's six o'clock and that many of us are at the end of our days in, today, including you, but I wanted to ask a kind of um, general question to you about your purposes for this uh, study and what, what, you, what you and your colleagues hope that you might achieve or catalyze with this project to gather data about online learning. You alluded a little bit in the beginning to an interest in informing policy, but I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit. I think the main thing I'm trying, I hope, will come out of the question is I, the, 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 I have to be careful here because we're not arguing that online learning is better than face to face teaching or anything like that. But I, I think I want to get over to faculty that this is not any longer a fringe activity. It is an important activity that has a, a role to play in many institutions. And that, um, so, uh, you, you, you know, you've kind of got to get involved in this one way or another. And I particularly think that the what's going to happen is that uh, blended and hybrid learning is going to become mainstream in the universities. And so the second thing I'm hoping is that this will force uh, institutions and governments to think very carefully about how they're going to prepare both students and instructors for this new type of learning that's going to come in. Um, and it's going to come in because it's going to make learning much more flexible for students, but more importantly, it's going to embed a lot of the skills that they need when they leave university, like independent learning, uh, knowledge management skills and so on. It's really good for developing those kinds of skills. So I, I, I'm that hoping it's coming, that, it's that it's already here. Having some hard data on this will 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 first of all grab a, the attention of instructors who can't any longer say, well, this isn't important, and secondly, will make institutions think about how they're going to support faculty as this is an ingro a growing an increasingly important part of university and college life. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, yes, absolutely it does. Um, I think someone, many of us could spend a long time wading through this data, especially as the years progress, if you manage to keep collecting 
to start looking for trends and patterns yeah. and change over time. Yeah. That's going to be very interesting. In, in fact, we've changed the title from a survey of online learning to uh, digital learning research. Uh, we we okay. think it's going to be more about digital learning than online because digital learning can be done on campus as well as online. Right. That was uh, really interesting, Tony. I didn't know a whole lot. I, I was vaguely aware of this project and hadn't really dug into the details. Uh, at your instigation, I've started reading the full reports that you can download here. There's a lot of unexplored data in here that I hope some of us will uh, move forward uh, on investigating with you um, this year or in future years. And I'm really grateful that you were willing to come to us with this. Um, I will be sharing this recorded um, uh, seminar with this group and all of the other people who wanted to hear it but weren't able to participate live. And of course, you'll be able to watch again and get in touch with Dr. Vogt and Tony or myself if you want, would like to think about project ideas or just getting involved in the research. Thank you, Tony.